Welcome to the Modern Motherhood Podcast from All Mom Does. I'm your host, Julie Lyles Carr. And one of the really high values for us here at the podcast is that you're getting connected in community. And that can happen in a lot of different ways. I myself really enjoy a lot of community online with other women in the business arena and the parenting arena, finding out their ideas and tips and tricks and, and just sharing hearts. It's a really important thing. But you know, it's also really important to have those face-to-face moments in community. And that's just one of the reasons I'm so excited to welcome my next guest to the podcast. Her name is Mandy Ariotto, and she is the president of MOPS. So Mandy, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh gosh, I'm so excited to be here. Tell everybody what MOPS is, just in case somebody doesn't know (laughs) what it is. I know we get we get calls at least, I don't know, five times a week here at the office of people looking for cleaning supplies, right? So <laughs> MOB stands for Mothers of Preschoolers. And essentially what we do is we gather moms all around the world together to talk about the things that are closest on our heart, like mothering and relationships and faith. And we really just encourage one another and build lifelong friendships. And you know, it's been the standard for many of us navigating those preschool years. I'm really honored to speak at a lot of local MOPS gatherings here in my area of the country. How many groups now does MOPS boast? How many groups are meeting? Oh, thousands and thousands. And we are all across the world. Actually, we're in over 50 countries. So it's just incredible. From Iraq to Dubai to Africa to Honduras, um, we have women meeting across the globe. So it's pretty neat to see groups meeting in huts and also here in Denver. You know, it's just such a a different experience, but we all have the same fears and hopes for our kids. How do you see that these gatherings of women, these community of women, how are those things changing for today's moms? And and what do you think has probably always been the same when a group of moms get together? But what's kind of new for this generation? And what are some constants that you see? Oh, such a good question. I was actually just looking at some statistics today about the general state of families and motherhood. And I found some things that were quite fascinating. Um, 45% of households across America have a mom who is the primary breadwinner. That's almost half of the families around the U.S. And in 2016, a report by the Obstetrics Clinical Committee in Australia reported that Suicide has become one of the leading causes of maternal death in Australia, which is mind-blowing to me. Wow. Um, 78% of moms say that they are currently today struggling with anxiety and depression. And so we just are really navigating some tough new things, I feel like, as a generation of moms and parents in the world today. Um, Two other huge topics for families right now are school violence, obviously. And then secondly, a ton of my friends are choosing to start having conversations with their kids about racial tension Mm -hmm. because it's still such a very real experience for so many of my friends with different amounts of melanin in their skin. And so conversations that parents are having just related to race and ethnicity and what does that mean and how we treat each other. And so it's a really interesting dynamic that we are currently living in culturally, and I feel like it's becoming increasingly divided. And so MOPS really tries to bring those conversations together and um, really have healthy dialogue around all of these new stats and all of these new realities that families are living. And then, of course, there's always the same core concerns that parents have, right? Like, how do I raise my kid to be a good person? Or how do I talk about faith in ways that are redemptive? Or how do I get my kid to keep their room clean? Like, these are always things that parents throughout the ages have been wrestling with. So there's a lot of new things and then a lot of just core things that are universal parent concerns. I think one thing that's really important for women to grab hold of in this generation, you know, sometimes I'll be talking with someone who's saying, wow, I'm really wrestling with how to have some of those conversations, whether that is on, you know, racial tension or school violence, some of the things that you've mentioned that previous generations just really haven't had the same kind of conversations about, if at all. And yet sometimes I get this pushback like, well, but you know, that women's Bible study or that women's group that's meeting or whatever, that's just for moms who stay home, or that's just for moms who are married to their children's father, or that's for, you know, fill in the blank. Like we think Mm -hmm. there's some stereotypical community member that if we don't meet the parameters of that stereotype, then we're not welcome. Now, I already know the answer to this, but I want to hear you say it loud and clear. 
That is not at all what groups like community groups like MOPS are about, that you have to somehow fit some kind of template. Talk about the women and the different seasons of life they're in and the different expressions of those lives that you see across these community gatherings. Yeah, that's the unique part of MOPS is that we are saying if you're a mom, you are with us because motherhood is this common denominator that is a universal language. And I feel like we can all speak it and it translates any of the divides that we typically create around ourselves. And so we really feel like moms need places to gather, to find encouragement, to have that conversation of like this thing happened today and I feel like a terrible parent and to have another person look at you and be like, hey, like that has happened to me too. Like let's just normalize it. It's not a big deal. You're going to be okay. And so MOPS is really a space, a unifying space where every woman is welcome, even regardless of faith. Like we want to have redemptive conversations about Jesus, but we also want any woman who wants mothering help or is seeking or is looking for what their spiritual journey, the next step is, we want them to feel welcome with us as well. You know, I'm curious to go back to a statistic that you mentioned, but let, let's build this out for, for just a minute. You know, we've got more parenting advice immediately available to us online than we could possibly ever implement, right? I mean, in every, yes. every iteration of possible parenting. And so if I'm a mom who's saying, well, I'm having some challenges, or I don't know what's normal or what's not, or what I should expect, or what kind of resources are out there, but hey, I can just jump online. Well, why do you think there's value in adding a meetup with other moms, that face-to-face? Because, you know, some people could argue, well, I can access all kinds of community and information online. What's the value of meeting person-to-person? So my husband and I always joke that, like, we have the entirety of all the knowledge of the human race, like, in the palm of our hand, right, in our phone. And while that is insanely helpful, it isn't translating into a healthier, well-adjusted, flourishing generation of human beings. And the statistics tell us that the opposite is happening. I was talking with a friend of mine, Amina, recently, and she was sharing this idea that really hit home with me. And she said, we can read an article or a website or a book that tells us how to parent, but it doesn't tell us how to be a parent to our kids. And we can read an article about marriage that tells us how to be married, but it won't tell us how to be married to our husband. And that is why it's important to meet together because in order to thrive, we have to live our lives in person. And that's why I believe uh, what most women are missing is this sense of a village. And instead, most of us are living what I call video game lives where we live through a screen, right? We get advice through the screen. We win fake battles through a screen. And what we're really craving is like that eye contact. And we need people in our lives to normalize situations like I talked about before. We need people to fill in the gaps when we are running late and we need help picking up our kids. Because I travel the world and I hear the same two things over and over again from women. And that's women who live in um, a hut in Africa or, you know, have a dirt floor in Honduras or are here in Denver, Colorado in a very affluent part of the world. What I hear are the same two things, it doesn't matter. And those are that women feel exhausted because they're doing so much. And the second thing is that they feel like they're not doing enough with their lives, which is Mm. crazy making, right? Right. So they're doing so much. And yet there's still that gnawing sense, like I should be doing more. There's something God put on my heart that I should be doing. I'm not providing the best birthday party for my kids or whatever the, the context is there. And that's why we need our village to remind us of who we are to remind us that we're doing enough, to call a time out when we are trying to overachieve our hustle for our worth. And that can only happen in the context of face-to-face. For some reason, this relationship that we create with people online, why, while there's some connection there, the truth of living fully really happens in the context of meeting with a person and feeling their warmth and hearing their voice. And so this idea of carving out an hour or two to to incorporate a meetup into the course of your month has been transformational for me. And I always sometimes dread going ahead of time. But then once I show up on my way home, I'm like, oh, that was exactly what I needed. And I think we just need more moments like that in our life. 
I'm kind of just got this statistic rolling around in my head that you mentioned earlier about the suicide rate in Australia of young moms. And I don't know if that article spoke to causality, but I have to wonder if isolation and overwhelm and postnatal depression, if those things played a factor. Did you notice anything when you were looking at those statistics about causality? Mm-hmm. It was. um, Some of it was postpartum depression, but a lot of it was a feeling of isolation. And again, it comes back to this idea of not having a support network um, who are like living next to you or grandmas or mothers who can provide that framework of support that we all desperately need. And reframing the conversation, because I think so often we as human beings, and especially women, are tempted to believe that like three things, right? Like I am what I have, I am what I do, and I am what others say about me. And all of those are lies that we can kind of fall into. I have is possessions, control, security, what we do, have we, you know, do we feel successful? And then what others say about us. And so if we can have other people in our lives who are countering those untruths, that is where we can step into fullness of life. And that really speaks to the depression and anxiety and those feelings of, is this even worth it? I think it'd be really fascinating, too, to look at statistics for young families today. For example, when my grandmother had my mother, she and my grandfather very intentionally lived very close to family. And so there was all the influence Mm -hmm. of all the grandparents and the community of aunts and uncles and so forth. When my mom and dad had me and when they went on to go to have my brothers, we followed my dad's career in the aerospace industry. And so we weren't raised around extended family. And one of the things I watched my mom do was very intentionally build herself a village, build community, because we didn't have that extended family. And my husband, Mike, and I for a while lived in your extended family got all the benefit of that which was amazing and then started moving around and I was actually just uh, interviewing your great good friend JJ Heller when she talked about leaving Arizona and going to Nashville and leaving the grandparents you know just how hard yes. that was so uh, yeah. you know what is it for this generation of moms today we don't have necessarily that you know collection of lifelong friendships we are such a mobile society i live in a very transient city as do you so how do why do we need to be intentional how can we be intentional to build that community to have the people to help pick up kids and run this and that and the other just those very functional things in life even beyond a little bit you know just this idea of wanting to make sure we are heart to heart but there's also just shoulder to shoulder right Totally. And I think it's such an intentional uh, decision that we have to make in our lives. And so I personally do a few things just that help me to create community in my life because we live in Denver. We don't have family around us. And so it's been an intentional choice to really bring people in. And so um, what I've recognized is that I had expectations around community that it needed to be this big dramatic thing and I needed to have lifelong friendships who they knew everything about me. And while I do have those things in my life, what I realized was a very, uh, a much more easy way to create community in my life was to recognize that I was going to create community wherever I went. So that means um, I've decided to put my phone away and to start striking up conversations when I'm in public places. I share a story in my book about a conversation I had with a man who was dying that I met in an oil change um, shop near my house. And I would never have had this conversation if I hadn't stopped and looked him in the eye and just sat for a moment and shared some words. And um, I travel a lot, so I try and on an airplane talk to the person next to me and and hear their story. And I feel like that's one small way that we start creating community, even if we don't have like parents or friends or people in our life who we can rely on for those big things. Maybe it just starts in the little ways. So my kids know in our grocery store that we go to all the time, the cashier's name. So we know Bo and we know Jeremiah and they know what grade my kids are in, and we have ongoing conversations every time we're there. And I think it's those little acts of building community that actually lead to the bigger acts of having your people and your village and those really deeply connected relationships that we all crave. I love that because I know for me, having moved around a lot as a kid and then swearing I wouldn't do it to my own kids and then 
We did it to our kids, too. There really is something about knowing those people at your local favorite restaurant, those people at the grocery store that you frequent, to begin to make those people, you know, really centralized characters, if you will, on the stage of your life. I think those are the places that make us begin to feel like we are home, even if it's a new environment, a new community that we've just moved into, to be really intentional about that. We'll be right back with our conversation with Mandy, who serves as the president of MOPS, along with being an author and a mom and a friend and all of those things. But first, we want to make sure you have the information about how you can get connected at MOPS. For over 40 years, MOPS has been inviting women into community through the commonality of motherhood, building friendships and earning the opportunity to share Jesus with them maybe for the first time. MOPS believes that all moms are world influencers and exist to encourage and equip all moms everywhere to live their best lives. Check out MOPS.org to find a local gathering in your neighborhood. Now, speak to us a little bit about, I find sometimes in the ministry work that I do at my home church, I find sometimes even though I'm part of a generation that says that they very much want community, they sort of don't really always know how to build it or their expectations of friendship or what friendship is supposed to look like. It's a little tricky because for a lot of us today, we really have been navigating friendships through the digital world, maybe even more to a degree than we have face-to-face conversationally. So what are some great things for us to know about the development of friendship and what reasonable expectations are on friendship? I think the most powerful way that we can view friendship is recognizing that our job as a good friend is to let our friends know that they're seen. So yesterday I was working from home. I have a book due in three weeks that I haven't started yet. Okay. So, (laughs) wow. Um, I I really want to hear about that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm definitely a procrastinator. But um, so I have a friend who knew this was the case. And midway through the day, I get a text and it says, I left some blended grass juice on your porch. She teases me because I like to drink green juice. So I go out on my porch and it's like a bottle of green juice and a little note that says, you've totally got this. Love, Emma. Oh, that's awesome. And I feel like that is what friendship means. It's carving a little time out of our day to create a moment for someone that lets them know that they are seen and loved. And I feel like we have a void in a lot of respects in our current culture where we have bought into the lie of convenience and speed. And so much of friendship pushes against both of those attributes, convenience and speed. It takes a little bit of time to build a deep friendship sometimes requires being inconvenienced to build friendship and community. And so I really feel like how we develop strong relationships is by creating special moments for people, by letting them know we're seen, by being really good listeners and really deeply trying to understand instead of seeking to be understood. And then one thing that I've been working on in my own life and it started a couple years ago was I recognized that in so many places in my life, I was showing up and wanting to impress people. I wanted people to like me. I wanted them to think I had everything, all the details together in my life. I wanted them to think I was funny or well-read or whatever, you know, those um, attributes were. And what I decided was instead of worrying about what other people thought of me, I wanted to show up and instead of when people left me that they felt better about me, I wanted them to feel better about themselves. And so really reframing that and saying, I'm showing up, I'm going to bring my full self. And when people leave my presence, I want them to feel exponentially better about who they are and who they're becoming. And that really shifted how I show up for people and has really deepened the relationships in my life. Oh, I think that is a great, great truth for people to get hold of that really it's about being willing to change our perspective of what am I going to get out of this friendship from that to saying, what can I invest in? I think that's so powerful. And you know, one thing I think that's happened to us as well is, I think in this digital platform, where we all seem to get sucked into, well, how many people are following my Instagram account? And how many people have I found on Facebook to be friends with and those kind of things? Not everybody has that lane, but a lot of us do. And we really take measures off of how great we think we're doing at friendship by how many followers we have in the social media platform. But 
What I'm finding is that really in my day-to-day world, I only have so much time for a certain number of friendships. And I don't mean that in an exclusionary way, like I only can have three friends at a time. But I'm just saying, I think sometimes Mm -hmm. the expectation we put on ourselves that somehow we're going to be able to really maintain at a super deep level, deep friendships with 150 people. I mean, is that even feasible? I heard a statistic once that said, we can manage 150 acquaintances in our life and five close friends. And I think that's absolutely accurate in my own life. Like, I can barely respond to the number of texts I get. Like, my friends tease me about how bad of a text responder I am. But here's the thing. Like, we are built to have deep relationship. And deep relationship doesn't happen wide. It happens deep. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable to say These are the people that I'm choosing to invest in at this season of my life. And in different seasons, it might look different. But I think that lets us off the hook from feeling like, and this, again, like you mentioned, it's not an an exclusionary type of way, but really just acknowledging this is what I can manage. And these are the relationships I'm intentionally investing in. And I think that's actually really healthy. And so really what I hear you saying, it's not that we're trying to develop a a clique and no one else is, is welcome in. I think we can always be welcoming But I do think in order to go deep, we are going to have to be really honest about how many friendships we can manage. And and I know people who, you know, maybe they can really handle seven, eight deep friendships. I know others that really two, three is the max for them in their season of life. I think you're so right. It's not exactly, you know, specifically about the math. It's really about evaluating where you're at. But I, I know for myself, it helps me feel a little bit off the hook to be reminded that while I want to be loving and compassionate with everyone I come across, I don't necessarily, it's not necessarily my responsibility to have those deep, deep relationships with every person. I'm having to learn to try to connect others who I think might have really powerful friendships, you know, and let them take that. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think that's a lot of what can happen around a table at Mops. You know, you may have, let's say, eight women around your table at Mops. There may be three or four that you really begin to develop a deep friendship with, and that's great. The other three or four may develop those relationships too. But talk about the role that I think is unique in MOPS and in other programs where you really have a person who's kind of that mentor mom, that discipler, the one who's, you know, who's been across some of these waters before, because in addition to hearing the word community is such a heart's cry in today's world, I also hear the word mentor, people really wanting to be mentored. So, so talk about that facet of it as well. Yeah, and this really goes back to that village idea where you had people a little bit farther along in the journey, like the sage wisdom that was inherently built into that system. And so what we recognize at MOPS is that mentoring and having someone who is a few steps ahead of us is like deeply essential and something that we all crave. Someone who can look at us and say, I have been there and I know what you're feeling and it's going to be okay. And so we integrate a mentoring experience into every MOPS group, recognizing that having women who can understand where we are in a particular season of mothering is essential to our own development and also to their uh, honoring their wisdom that they've lived through and are eager to share. And so it's this really interesting symbiotic relationship that happens. It's spiritual director slash motherhood champion slash um, older sister relationship that is staggering to see how deep and wide those relationships go and the women who benefit from having that person in their life as a as a trusted mentor. Now, I don't have preschoolers in my house anymore, much to my own denial, because, you know, I keep looking at my <laughs> 10 year old. I, I, I know, but I keep looking at these babies thinking, how are they 10? Like, I think they're three. Mm-hmm. I think they're actually three. <laughs> but let's, you know, give me some some qualities that you think make for great mentors, because we may have listeners out there who are like, well, you know, I'm, I'm a little further along. I'm still kind of in the depths in the in the mentoring or in the mothering. But what are some of the qualities of a mentor who really is able to invest well in the lives of other women? My favorite quality in a mentor is someone who is willing to be like, I really screwed up. Or I made this mistake and they're willing to be really vulnerable about it. I think honesty in a mentoring relationship is one of the greatest gifts we give to one another. And then also a posture of curiosity, 
of being willing to walk alongside another person and to get curious about their life and to ask good questions and to help them really analyze the decisions they're making, the questions that they have, and then cheering them on to become this full version of who God created them to be. And so vulnerability, curiosity, and really this genuine interest in seeing another woman live up to who God shaped her into even as she was being knit together in the womb. And so those are some of my favorite qualities in a mentor. And I think that's really powerful because I think sometimes we get the word mentor or counselor or therapist a little bit confused in today's culture. And so I think it's really important to keep in mind that if, you know, there's a place where God may be calling you to mentor into someone's life, you don't have to have it all figured out. You know, just the fact you're a little bit further down the lane is going to be of such powerful help to those who are now walking through those steps with younger kids and and trying to figure out how to do it. Now, what do you recommend for women once their children get a little bit older? What do we do next? Because let's say they've had a fantastic MOPS experience, but now their kids are getting a little older. What are next steps for them in terms of community? Yeah, that's a great question. I have a teenager, an almost teenager now, and I continually find myself saying, I need MOPS now just as much as I did when my kids were little. Mm -hmm. So we actually at MOPS have really widened our doors, and we have a few new programs that we're launching for every mom. Um, Moms, We call it Moms Next, and then we have two other new programs, one's Collectives, and that's just a really short six-week program where we talk about one topic and then we also have meetups and that's just a once a month meeting where moms come together talk through a couple questions pray for each other and uh, talk about one particular topic that might be significant in their mothering journey and so we really recognize that this mothering process requires us being together and throughout our entire journey and while the preschool years are essential. So is every other stage. And so we really have worked hard to create some new opportunities for moms of all ages who have, who have kids of all ages to come together in unique ways. I think that's really exciting to hear that you're continuing the journey on. So what's on the horizon for MOPS? We've just talked about these new programs that are coming to the table, which I think is fantastic. But what are some of your goals and, and you know, some of the things you would love to see happen during your tenure as president of MOPS? Yeah, so what we know is that there's 2 billion moms in the world. 2 billion. Wow. 2 Wowza. billion. Crazy, right? So our MOPS globally is spreading like wildfire, and we're seeing more and more moms who desperately need community and hope and um, all the things that MOPS provides. And so we're growing really fast globally, but we just really want to resource moms well and bring as many moms into the community experience as possible. So we have widened our experience a little bit. And up until this point, MOPS only met in churches. And so what we recognize is that that's not an option for a lot of people. They don't feel comfortable walking through the door of a church. And so we want to go and be where moms are. And so MOPS can meet now in homes and in the YMCA. Uh, We have a partnership with Chuck E. Cheese, if that's, you know, your jam. But um, what we recognize is Wait a minute. Is is Chuck E. Cheese really anybody's jam, Isn't that crazy? (laughs) (laughs) I just, I'm just doing a little pulse check. I'm just curious. I know. I know. Unless it's the kind of situation, right, where you can like sit around a table with your crew while your kids are off like doing their thing. Gotcha. Like I can see where that might be in in a doable scenario. All right. Um, But yeah, so we're just, what we recognize is... uh, There's all sorts of options for moms to get together, and we're really excited to be in some new spaces to make that happen. Now, as the leader of this organization, MOPS, you're on the road a lot. You've got four kids at home, a book due in three weeks. (laughs) How are you doing? How are you doing all the things and maintaining community and making sure you're getting all the boxes ticked? Because, you know, we might have moms listening who are like, "How, how is she getting all that in? Yeah, there are seasons where I do it very poorly is the honest (laughs) answer. Um, I think moms of any age or stage can kind of relate to that chronic low-grade feeling of mom guilt, that at some point you're not doing all that you could. That's something that I wrestle with all the time. But the ways that I really try to make community a priority in my own life 
are really cultivating those long-term friendships I have. But also this past year, what I've decided is that I needed to have more fun in my life. And I have waited my entire life to have fun when my to-do list is checked off. And that has never, ever occurred. And so I put have more fun at the top of my to-do list. And it's so surprising because I think so often we're so cerebral about our lives that we overthink things. And when I started to just choose to have more fun, it was interesting because people wanted to join in. Wow. And suddenly this community was built around our family and the choices we were making and the priorities that we were putting at the top. And so that little shift to decide to have more fun actually created a really intense community experience for our family. And people are just coming in and flocking and stopping by our house and coming over for dinner and wanting to join us in these fun things that we're doing. So I wonder if one really simple way to create community in our lives if we're feeling lonely is to just go out and start having more fun. I love that. I think that is just fantastic. And I'm probably going to just absolutely steal that from you, but I'll footnote it. Uh, <laughs> you know, and start putting that at the top of my planner as well, because that completely resonates with me. You know, okay, I'm, I'm qualified or I'm worthy enough to have fun once the to-do list is all checked off and then it doesn't happen. So I think that is just absolutely brilliant. Now, tell us about your book, Starry Eyed, and then tell us about the book that you are desperately (laughs) trying to get finished. (laughs) (laughs) So Starry Eyed is really looking at how motherhood can be complex and our lives can be complex and filled with beautiful moments and then moments that really leave us in despair and darkness and reconciling that God is in both of those. He's in the light and the dark and the beauty and the heartache. And it's filled with personal stories about my life and about my mothering journey and really coming to terms with this fact that God cares deeply about all of the experiences that we navigate. And then my new book is actually called Have More Fun, and it will come out next April And it's my journey and the scientific research behind this idea of what does it look like to choose fun? And it's fascinating. I learned that our brains actually, when they're deprived of fun, they stop demanding it. It's like this weird cycle that happens where when we don't choose joy and delight, we need less of it. And so that really shook me to my core to recognize that. I want to have a very high need for fun and joy and delight because I actually think that's a holy, a holy endeavor. Wow, that's beautiful. Now, tell us how we can get involved in MOPS in our local communities. What is the process for being able to jump in to community with MOPS? It's super simple. You can go to mops.org and you can do a search for a group near you. Or we also have MOPS membership. And that really is a global sisterhood membership. And this next year you get a giving key when you register for membership and all sorts of other goodies, including weekly encouragement. And you get to be part of this global sisterhood. Part of your membership fee goes to doing good in the world and supporting our sisters in other parts of the world. So It's really a huge, huge movement of women who are coming together and using their voices and encouraging each other and really doing tremendous things in the world to bring about holy, peaceful, redemptive things for our kids. That's awesome. Well, Mandy, such a delight to have an opportunity to talk with you. Mandy Ariota, the she is the president of Mops, the author of Starry Eyed and the forthcoming, give me the title again. Have more fun. <laughs> have more fun. Hope this has been a conversation that has inspired you to find community and to get connected to others and really be able to enjoy all the wealth that those kinds of friendships can bring. You can connect with Mandy at Mandy Ariotto on all the socials, and that's Ariotto, A-R-I-O-T-O. And also be sure and check out mops.org. You'll find all kinds of great information there, places to plug in in your locale. You don't want to miss all the treasures that are on that site. I'd love to connect with you too at all the socials. Julie Lyles Carr, that's L-Y-L-E-S-C-A-R-R, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Hey, a big shout out to Donna Toady. She is our producer, and Rebecca Beckett, our content coordinator. Be sure and also check out All Mom Does, both the blog and on the socials. All kinds of great inspiration and community for you as you traverse this parenting and womanhood journey with us. Well, coming up next week... 
I could not be more excited about this guest and for you to hear this conversation. I sort of think of him as, I don't know, like the universal ambassador of friendship and laughter. That's right. We've got Bob Goff coming to the Modern Motherhood Podcast. We'll catch you next week.